Sahar Musin Laufmann. She came here to give us a keynote speech about um, how sustaining self and others form a feedback loop, trauma stewardship as a radical act of social change. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to have her here. And she comes from a non-profit or profit organization called Return of the Village. So welcome, Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. So I always like to start with a poem. Uh, and this poem is called A Vision. If we will have the wisdom to survive, to stand like slow growing trees on a ruined place, renewing, enriching it, if we will make our seasons welcome here, asking not too much of earth or heaven, then a long time after we are dead, the lives our lives prepare will live here. Their house is strongly placed upon the valley sides, fields and gardens rich in the windows. The river will run clear as we will never know it, and over it bird song like a canopy. On the levels of the hills will be green meadows, stop bells in noon shade. On the steeps where greed and ignorance cut down the old forest, an old forest will stand, its rich leaf fall drifting on its roots. The veins of forgotten springs will have opened. Families will be singing in the fields. In their voices, they will hear a music risen out of the ground. They will take nothing from the ground they will not return, whatever the grief at parting. Memory native to this valley will spread over it like a grove, and memory will grow into legend, legend into song, song into sacrament. The abundance of this place, the songs of its people and its birds, will be health and wisdom and indwelling light. This is no paradisical dream. Its hardship is its possibility. And that's Wendell Berry. So I want to talk to you about a few things today, like um, anti-discrimination work within the climate action uh, framework. This will include social permaculture, climate equity or climate justice, having a systems theory approach to analyzing problems, and structuring solutions. As well as the importance of intersectional movements for increased efficiency. I want to encourage you to decolonize your minds, your movements, and your organizations. And I also want to talk to you about trauma stewardship. Uh, I also want to start with a disclaimer. You wouldn't try to conduct an intricate chemistry experiment without like consulting a chemist. And in the same respects, when you're talking about like education to counter oppression, it's really important to find somebody who is trained in this field. Uh, oftentimes, somebody has an opinion on the subject, and if they aren't trained, that can be detrimental. It can go completely counter to uh, assisting with dismantling systems of domination. So, in many cases, um, defer to recognize knowledge in the field, which is often historical and scholarly based. At the same time, I own my privilege of education in saying that, and, and understand that not everybody has access, resources, or inclination to get educated. In that case, I want to point your attention to the thousands of opportunities where somebody who is more socially disadvantaged than you could use a hand and believe me you've crossed them you've crossed these many missed opportunities so just think about it just think about when you can like lend a hand um, also co contrary to popular belief this is not a um, impulse gratification process. You don't hear a talk, go to a workshop, and then it's done. And so as a master scholar, I learn stuff every day on the subject. So, let's start with social permaculture. Simply put, 
If one thing flourishes, so does the other. By nourishing and supporting more parts of a system, it is stronger and more vibrant in its entirety. So, uh, according to Diane Leaf Christian, author of the key book on intentional communities, Creating a Life Together, 90% of intentional communities fail, largely because of conflict. A big part of this is, just like monocrops being the antithesis of healthy ecology, monoculture is the antithesis of healthy communities. We need diversity, both in how we plant and in how inclusive we are to the diverse spectrum of humanity. I'm strongly in the camp that this is not um, an either or, or somebody versus another. So I don't think it's native versus immigrant. I don't think it's climate activist versus high CO2 footprint individual or bad politician. Um, I think about it in terms of a spectrum of change. So we have active change agents and we have people who have yet to be awoken as change agents. And I want to share a quote with you by Gus Spath. Um, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought this with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Have you ever heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people? Or um, that every action is either a request for love or an offering of love? Uh, trying to view things through this lens may assist us in engaging a revolution of the heart. And I'm not talking about spiritual bypass where our personal peace and pleasure uh, is overshadows our responsibility and culpability in the struggle for equity, but innovating the revolution toward connection and healing. Co-creating wholeness, both for our planet, our movements, but also for each individual. From the Fellowship of Intentional Communities, we are embedded in larger systems that do not encourage beneficial relationships. Our overarching economic system sacrifices the good of people and the earth to the goal of achieving short-term profits. It maintains itself by fostering systems of prejudice and exploitation. Racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, all those constructs that separate us and elevate some people's good over others. Those systems affect us deeply, often unconsciously, no matter how much we might deplore them and struggle against them. So understanding the whole nuance of the matrix of oppressive systems helps you better interrupt business as usual to affect positive social change. And I'm going to talk to you now about intersectionality. Interestingly, I have been here for several days and we have been deep in um, conferences, workshop, think tank, all this. And the term intersectionality has been used quite a lot. But what I have witnessed is that this conversation about intersectionality has been primarily about intersecting climate action movements. And I'm just going to read the definition for you. It's an approach that was largely advanced by women of color arguing that classifications, social constructs, such as gender, race, class, ability, as well as others, cannot be examined in isolation from one another. They interact and intersect in individuals' lives, in society,
society, in social systems, and are mutually constitutive. So while all of these discussions about intersectionality have been going on, I've not once heard somebody mention race or gender. I think that's interesting, and I think that's a growing edge for us. So just to give you a little image about intersectionality. In the early civil rights movement, we found things like racism in the feminist movement, uh, or homophobia in the racial justice movement. At this time, we again find really strong but individuated movements. Often, each thinks that their struggle, of their struggle in terms of hierarchy, right? That one is more important than the other, uh, rather than that each mu movement is mutually relevant in the pursuit of liberation. And that the intersecting and unification of these struggles is an important part of their ultimate success. Uh, so Forbes and like the McKinley Business Institute did all these studies on diversity and they found that like when you had diverse workspaces there was um, like increased financial capital, or more innovative solutions. And this is just, as I was mentioning again, about diversity versus monocropping, right? This is what happens when you have diversity perspectives. You are more innovative with your solutions. And a major focus of why we need to turn towards intersecting our movements. Okay again from the Fellowship of Intentional Communities. The key insight of social permaculture is that while changing individuals is indeed difficult, we can design social structures that favor beneficial patterns of human behavior. Just as in a garden, we might mulch to discourage weeds and favor beneficial soil bacteria. In social systems, we can attempt to create conditions that favor nurturing, empowering relationships. Systems thinking allows you and your organizations and communities to see the larger design, to gauge how seemingly unrelated actions have consequences. System thinking allows us to test our own assumptions and resist the urge to make decisions based on opinions or limited information. Organizations that understand how interconnected, complex systems work in their industry can leverage that knowledge for benefit of their communities and goals. So permaculture has three core ethics, which we saw in the first slide. Care for the earth, care for the people, and care for the future. The third ethic is often framed as fair share. Share surplus and reduce consumption. These ethics can serve as a guideline for weighing our decisions and actions. Before we build a structure or engage in a new endeavor, we ask ourselves, how will this impact the environment around us and what resources will it use? Will it provide for people and community and future um, empowerment and equality or the reverse? Asking critical questions is core to creating positive social change. We think about how much trash, fuel, or carbon our lives are generating. We should also question our biases. The basic necessities that we are access to that others are excluded from. How we can leverage our privilege to co-create equity and how our words or actions might generate suffering. Acknowledging our social locations and asking critical questions is the crux of countering oppression. 
And in the same vein, it doesn't start and end with one statement or question. For instance, we might as a people decide that we believe in the concept of fair share. Did you know that the fair trade certification still operates within the capitalistic paradigm? You need money for certifications. And that already hints at hierarchies of privilege. In some cases, by buying fair share certified products, it leads to disproportionate pay for women and children who cannot afford the certification. Don't worry, there's an app for that, Bicot. And remember, you vote with your dollar. There is a difference between operating from the perspective of a colonized mind and the perspective of prioritizing ancestral knowledge. Ancestral knowledge, cultural preservation, and ecologically minded earth care are all forms of countering oppression. I want to talk to you about a couple models of identity formation that are utilized in multicultural competent counseling. So um, there's racial identity formation, but also integrated models that take into effect other social locations. I'm sharing this because as a scholar and researcher, I've been observing German cultural behavior. And I, uh, I've definitely arrived at the understanding that this is something that's really needed. <clears throat> so I'll just go over a few of the models. Um, from the integrated model, the first stage is conformity, similar to assimilation. And the second is dissonance, so it's confusion from experiencing discrimination. They want to assimilate to the dominant culture, but see how they are still excluded for being different. So take somebody who has an invisible um, mental health uh, disability. They try to act normative, they try to act normative, and they still kind of see that they're not included. At this point, there's an immersion phase, so it's anger about the discrimination and belief that most non-target people are prejudiced. In the immersion stage includes sticking to your own group, avoiding contact with the dominant group, and the internalization stage is noticing negative qualities within their own group that not all non-target people are their enemy, that discrimination is their enemy, and that they can fight against it. They expand their identity beyond social location. That's when you come to integration. Interestingly, I've noticed that the term integration is used quite a lot in Germany, and what it's really talking about is assimilation. It's white is right. Go with the dominant. Um, a lot, oftentimes, the social location of language is used as the barrier. So, since there are a lot of white people in this room, I will go over the white racial identity formation phases and stages. The first is contact. Your unconsciously racist holds to the idea of being colorblind, doesn't believe in racism. The second stage is disintegration. So the experience forces you to confront reality of discrimination. This is often coupled with guilt. Now guilt is a trauma response, and we'll talk about that a lot more in the workshop. Uh, reintegration is this blaming the victim. The belief that white people are superior, which is why they have more privilege. The fourth stage is pseudo-independence. It's the first stage of positive racial identification. So you no longer believe that white is superior, and you look to POC, but not yourself, to confront and uncover discrimination. You comfort POCs in their struggle in effort to feel like you are no longer racist. You're still confused about how to be white, and non-racist. The fifth stage is immersion immersion, which makes a genuine attempt to connect to your own white identity and to be anti-racist. There's a deep concern with connecting to other white people who are confronting racism. And the sixth, and of course you can use isms, and you can interchange like with the integrated model to different social locations. The sixth and final phase is autonomy. There's a clear understanding and positive connection to your white racial identity while also actively pursuing social justice. 
So let me just take another moment to explain how this looks. You can take a person, say a person of color, who thinks that they just need to assimilate as much as possible. They need to be as German as possible and then they'll be accepted. And they're totally happy to do it. They are welcome to colonize their own mind and be cut themselves off from their cultures of origin and adopt whatever the stance is. And maybe that stance is capitalism, right? And at some point, they experience racism, uh, and it's so diminishing to them that they can't actually conform entirely. There's no way for them to. They're like struck with this, I've got to do it, right? I've got to recognize that I'm never going to be completely included. And then they reject. They reject the dominant culture. They're like, all oh, white people are bad, or whatever. They go into their own bubble, and they're like, and then maybe there they, they experience ableism or homophobia. And they're like, you know what, actually there's problems all across the board. And then they decide, you know, I am a multicultural being and I get to choose who I am. What is my identity? Separate from social categories. I am a part of them, I'm connected to them, but I am still more than that, yeah? And that's when that dynamic tension from the trauma starts to release. So we're gonna talk about power. And that really um, fits into this as well. <clears throat> I want to talk first about how the oppressor becomes the oppressed, or how the oppressed becomes the oppressor. So you know, like originally in Germany, it was like indigenous tribal culture, right? And then the Romans came in and colonized and really actually started this cycle that kept getting perpetuated. Um, in the U.S., we talk about this concept of the house nigger. So, like, there were slaves in the field, and then they would take one out, and they would be, like, the house one. They'd be the main one, and then they'd be whipping the slaves because their only experience of freedom and autonomy was in their perspective, the role model of their oppressors. So they mimic their oppressors the second that they have it, freedom or autonomy. And this is why many movements unconsciously perpetuate hierarchy, right? Once they have become more established and have political funding, because this is just what we see and we start to internalize it. So there's several forms of power. I'm gonna use Starhawk's, um, I'm gonna use Starhawk's model here. So, Power over is ownership or connected to those who have it. It depends on coercion, like the power of the state, right? And power over and under are complementary. And then there's power with, right? Community, solidarity, it depends on mutual care, respect, cooperation. And then there's power from within, right? This is spiritual or emotional, or intellectual, it depends on trusting your own experience, right, and taking initiative. So we can see that this final stage of racial and integrated uh, models of identity formation phases and stages is really in tune with this power from within. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about power. Power is often defined through agency, and agency is the freedom or ability to act independently, or make conscious choices or decisions for yourself. So power is the ability to affect the world or change your circumstances. This is often determined by access to resources, unequally distributed globally, wealth, whiteness, citizenship, patriarchy, heterosexism and education, are a few key social mechanisms through which power operates. Social power, or how one is viewed and the self-image one has, often dictates a sense of entitlement or lack of it. The more marginalized the group or groups that people are a member of, the less they are looked to for solutions, the less they will put their experiences forward in settings dominated by people from more privileged groups. This determines who dominates the situation and whose opinion is taken seriously, or the legitimization of authority. 
Generally, the people with the least social power know the most about what is taking place because their survival depends on it. The more the setting is dictated by the stand for the status quo, the less the particularity of their experience will be expressed, relegating those from the dominant culture with less information. These dynamics cause the issue that the ones who are expected to solve problems are the least equipped to do so. And I want to talk about two other factors that largely condition the perpetuation of oppression. First is conversation, right? The power of our words, unconscious statements, dialogue, narratives. And again, we'll go into this in more depth in the workshop. So this is such as how we have a conversation about oppressive dynamics, right? Including like classic faux pas or this nervous tendency to not know how to talk to someone across social locations that stops you from even making a bridge. The second factor is trauma. So we live in a world where just about everything is bowed and rifted by systemic oppression. This affects the lives of all people within the system uplifting a dominant narrative and suppressing the stories and perspectives of, marginalized, of the marginalized. This affects as well the degree of happiness or trauma warping mental health of people in the system. Which means that as a result, and in many cases, short-term feel-good is far outweighing common sense. Given that people are walking around with a myriad trauma triggers with no disclaimer you can imagine if you trip one of these seemingly invisible landmines you can end up on somebody's wrong side and no amount of common sense will help certain information get through that's why trauma stewardship or holding fast to a sense of kindness and unconditional positive regard can help us to build and mend bridges and in turn be more effective at our goals of inclusion and unifying. Just remember, it's not about being right. It's about helping others to feel right, both with themselves and with you, so that you can exchange ideas and co-create positive movements. So, many who have privilege based on holding non-target identities are traumatized and deformed by guilt or shame and a sense of diminished integrity as they live within a system that limits recognizing humanity's full potential. Those without privilege based on arbitrary social categories are pressed into ways of being that discount their dignity and the authority of their narratives, effectively limiting their agency or access to self-determination. We have to learn how to talk to one another, how to bridge across barriers of stance, privilege, and awareness to form bonds that lead to a unified movement for the sake of our planet. Another super relevant point of information for Germans is the topic of microaggressions which are often unconscious and unintentional, but oppressive statements and trauma triggers that are used every day and effectively classify people as other, other than the norm, right? If one more person tells me to learn German, I swear. <laughs> as if I have never ending free time and a support structure. So we need to learn how to talk about this and how to talk to each other across sociocultural barriers. Only when we heal this deep rift of wanting to be heard and honored as human beings with inherent value will we begin to step forward together into a sustaining future. I like to describe privilege as archways that are so wide, you know, so open that you hardly even notice them. 
but manifest like doors that are closed and locked to other people. To continue this analogy, imagine the labyrinth-like maze that we need to go through to get anywhere near along the lines of the same path as those who barely notice these thresholds. Right? It leaves people depleted, exhausted, and not nearly as far along on the basics necessary for survival. And it's from this place that there's an expectation that others will come over. I mean, I've heard this a ton of times. I've had this conversation so many times this week. It's this, we want to have intersecting movements, but they should come over here. <laughs> they should come over here and join us. Join us. It's always this, right? And again, this is the hierarchy. Why, why can't we just join one another? Why can't we create collaborative spaces? Why can't we create collaborative movements? Why can't we have Skillshare events where we're all coming together and resourcing each other? So I think it's really important that we talk about climate justice or climate equity. And it's the idea that the more developed countries should first move towards lowering their emissions before less developed. So, you know, it takes into effect this idea that some places need to build hospitals. And even the process to go through that creates emissions. And shouldn't they have the resources and the energy to do that in whatever means they, they are doing that before we expect them to make the effective changes towards what's going to be best for the climate? Shouldn't we, as the industrialized, developed, several decades later of super high emissions country, do it now so that they can have a little time to develop? This is the whole concept of climate equity. So I will, again, read this. So how to share both the burdens and opportunities of the global transition to low carbon development. Some countries emphasize responsibilities, usually explained as the historical responsibility developed countries have because of the greenhouse gases they emitted in the process of growing economically. Other countries focus on capabilities. The capacity countries have now to deal with climate change, such as their financial and technological resources to reduce domestic emissions or support adaptation research and activities. Several options for differentiation have been suggested over the years, including historical responsibility, levels of economic development, vulnerabilities, and needs. I also think it's really interesting. I, I, I like to tell a story about going to India and being with other young, able-bodied international travelers and having them always comment on the trash, you know? <clears throat> it's bad. I mean, there's trash in all of the waterways. They burn it everywhere. But, you know, I wonder how, how deeply people think into how that trash got there. Because I'm from the US and we sell our trash to India. Germany, you sell yours to Africa, by the way. So, um, so all these young, able-bodied Western people who are like, how could the Indians do that with their trash? I'm like, that's your trash. <laughs> your trash being sent to, to communities that are stricken with poverty, what means do they have to manage it? So, they burn it. So I think that that could definitely also be included in this whole concept of climate equity that we need to produce less trash. Not that they need to figure out how not to burn our trash. Um, so I'm really, I'm really actually super into things being fun. <laughs> and during the workshop, there'll be a lot of games. And as you can see, I have a lot of comics. I'll see if I have time to share one more with you. Um, and the reason is because of what I said about trauma and how guilt and shame create this resistance to engagement. 
And we want to get past that. We want to heal ourselves. We want to heal our ancestors. I do a lot of ancestral healing work so that we can step forward from a fresh, clean, happy, and fun, loving space to do this work. Because this work is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And this topic of burnout just keeps coming up this week as well. And it shouldn't be like that. If you're burning yourself out, you're not doing it right. And I want, again, to talk a little bit about what I think is the right way to be doing this. So I want to talk to you about the word uh, liminality. <laughs> and I'll do some definitions in case you don't know what it is. So the word liminal comes from the Latin root limen, which means threshold or place of transition. This liminal space refers to a physical, emotional, behavioral, and psychological transition. During liminal periods of all kinds, social hierarchies may be reversed or temporarily dissolved. Continuity of tradition may become uncertain, and future outcomes, once taken for granted, may be thrown into doubt. The dissolution of order during liminality creates a fluid, malleable situation that enables new institutions and customs to become established. So we'll talk about temporary autonomous zones, right? Does anybody know what that is? A temporary autonomous zone? The climate camp. <laughs> So it's coined by, in the 1990s by the poet and anarcho Emedius and Sufi scholar Hakim Bey, and the term Temporary Autonomous Zone, or TAZ, seeks to preserve the creativity, energy, and enthusiasm of autonomous uprisings without replicating the inevitable betrayal and violence that has been the reaction to most revolutions throughout history. The answer, according to Bey, lies in refusing to wait for a revolutionary moment, and instead creating spaces of freedom in the immediate present while avoiding direct confrontation. The TAZ is a liberated area of land, time, or imagination, where one can be for something not just against, and where new ways of being human together can be explored and experimented with. Locating itself in the cracks and fault lines in the global grid of control and alienation, a TAZ is an eruption of free culture where life is experienced at maximum intensity. It should feel like an exceptional party where for a brief moment our desires are made manifest. And we all become the creators of the art of everyday life. So... Liminal spaces are powerful cracks in the system where we can leverage for positive social change. This is a topic of emergent thinking. So that means no one can tell you how to do this, partially because it, beca because it becomes exponentially more effective when you synergize it with your purpose. Are you a dancer? I just came from Polvovitz, where they like revolutionized this like dance to Britney's Toxic, like as like a direct opposition to the mining company. Yeah, I thought that was super creative. Um, <clears throat> what if you're an artist and an introvert? You know, there's this. I love this story. I tell it all the time. There's this case of these introverted activists that like sewed uh, to craft these love letters. Uh, and they would sit them in shirt pockets in retail stores. And they actually offered them to board members of a corporation who took into advisement what they were saying and actually changed one of their board votes towards something that was that basically reached the aim of the activists. So again, I want to talk to us about how to remember this revolution of the heart, creating bridges, integrating personal purpose, and how we're making movements more effective, more diverse. Because diversity, yes, it's social location, but it's also personal identity, right? So you too can revolutionize and synergize your particular passions and purpose to find nuance within the system that you can leverage for positive social change.
Thank you. talk a bit more about the cracks and as far as I understood you were saying this is a crack here but I would love to hear more about cracks that you've come across yeah so um, yeah again on the topic of liminality leverage points temporary autonomous spaces it does tie into this idea of personal Dharma or purpose and identity, like all of the points really tie together. Which is to say that the more that we're we're walking our path with these conditioned boxes, and no matter how alternative we think we are, we have them. It, there's no getting past conditioning. But you can be like um, I weave baskets, right? And I think about it in terms of like constantly unweaving these rifts that were sewn into my the fabric of my being as I weave my life. So to me it's this it's this it's this a constant pulse between undoing these knots and reweaving. And in that same respect, like um, I've heard a lot from people in the West of this sense of isolation. And I am part of so many communities doing so much volunteer work and I don't have this problem with isolation. And it's, I mean, the work that I'm doing is offering of myself for the sake of social change. So I'm serving others in a lot of respects, but I am also served. Again, so this is what speaks to how sustaining self and others forms a feedback loop. There is this social conditioning that giving of yourself is somehow going to make you lose something. And there's definitely a lot culturally around like narcissistic taking mentalities. So you do need to have a certain level of discernment about where you're giving to. And that's why for me, and it has grown, that I'm giving less to individuals and more to organizations I believe in. And usually the organizations are obscure, they're marginalized, you know, they're, they're under these larger umbrellas where those people have most of the funding and are sitting pushing paper and these guys are just on the ground creating creative projects. So I have learned how to have discernment about who I'm giving my energy and time to and in that same respect I gain community and it's extremely nourishing. And um, that's why I mentioned the bit about emergent thinking because you, you really actually have to allow yourself to feel what what drives me? What does my heart sing for? I am a believer and I believe that we came with a purpose and that each purpose is individual and unique and completely necessary and that we can integrate. We can integrate whatever it is that drives us. I mean, we've been talking, I, I think I brought it forward like a dozen times in the 2020 conferences that, what about the artists? Artists could create comics about climate action. I haven't seen a lot. I'd like to because isn't that like a really effective way to get this message across, you know? And we just have to start thinking and like we just have to start thinking about more ways to integrate and that just takes time of being with yourself and being within systems, especially temporary autonomous spaces like this where it is, it's a place you can come in and you can let go a little bit. You can let go of these social conditioned ways that you have to hold yourself in certain, uh, around certain people, and you can just feel out what is myself, because that's a huge part of it. Hi, I would also comment um, um, about the, the autonomous zones. I am confused also about it, it's my first, and I'm confused about it because I feel it's like a privilege and a space to escape where usually when you do climate action from, I don't know, where the international at least, people I know usually you really have to confront in your community and you don't have this 
privilege to do it somewhere and like actually it, it seemed a bit more individualistic to a certain group of people who spoke, speak in a certain way, who believe in a certain way. It's not as open. And it was really, I always wanted to speak with people about this, what they think and how. And so I'm really confused about <laughs> such space. I mean, and I would love to have a conversation or have an open space session to speak also about that. I think this is really important. And there are a few things that I have mentioned in spaces like this. One being, um, if it's not accessible to the poor, it's, it's not revolutionary. This is the quote. Maybe you guys have heard. And so the fact that it that a lot of these spaces are more affordable is really encouraging to me. The second is ability. I absolutely look around to see like how accessible it is for, for people with different abilities. And that's really, really huge for me. And so if I don't see anybody with varying like physical or mental abilities, it's problematic for me. And then another one which is often invisible is children. Um, Earth-based spaces are really, really big on acknowledging that children are human beings too and should be acknowledged and honored. And my kids are behind here in the kinder space being watched so that I can teach here. So in that respect, and as a marginalized person that's low income, I do need to be funded to be able to come into spaces like this, and I am being. So I think that these are really important critical questions, and it's why I, didn't, I don't go to Burning Man, you know, and I've been invited, because it's problematic. It's really problematic, uh, and so these. And I want to also talk to the Life Just Climate Camp, while acknowledging that this is the original climate camp that has now started picking up everywhere. And there, I saw um, white people with dreads covering their hair in solidarity with people who were um, triggered by cultural appropriation of the sign of dreads. I saw men wearing bra bras because being topless would have disincluded both. Um, different Muslim people who would not feel comfortable with half-naked men, as well as not acknowledging that women don't have the same flexibility to go around topless. And these were major signs of, let's, we're moving the movement towards inclusion. And these are the critical questions that we need to be asking in, in able to create inclusive spaces. I just wanted to remind you that you can also speak in German. Uh, wenn ihr Fragen habt oder irgendwie Anmerkungen, könnt ihr das auch gerne auf Deutsch machen. Es gibt Übersetzungen, ihr müsst euch keinen abbrechen. Das ist voll okay. Ich continuing this conversation of is this camp like a revolutionary space or it has been said it's not like what would push it kind of over this limit I'm asking myself what kind of practices I don't know would be would be revolutionary um, so one of the things that I suggested a couple of times but I think it is important to reiterate is that you, you could offer this also as a Skillshare based gathering and open up the uh, invitation to other movements like anti-discrimination movements uh, and other communities. Um, again, it does take some kind of focus and in these cases I've often suggested that you need an ambassador or a liaison person who's familiar and works with other counter-oppression-based movements and organizations to be able to go in to extend the invitation to create the bridge of um, building relationship. But yeah, that that's something that I think would be huge in terms of like, I don't think a lot of people know about it or know what's going on um, outside of the climate action community. And so we are sharing it. Uh, also, Germany is highly uh, under-digitalized, as a, I've just noticed. So there's not much there's not much ways for people to plug in if they don't already know what they're looking for. So making sure that there's some kind of digital platform where people can connect in, whether it's more social media marketing or um, even video conferencing space, that really I think helps not just 
with creating more inclusive and diverse um, invitations and uh, attendees, but also with helping people who are here sustain in terms of feeling connected to people in the movement to come out of here.